I'm going to rush through this, which ones to operate. Hemant has already spoken about it and so has uh, Rohan. But it's basically the ones that are displaced considerable comminution with osteoporosis and polytrauma and when there is considerable ulnar-sided instability. If it's an intra-articular fracture, then you should look for the separation, whether it's impacted, whether you can reduce it or not. And then again, the same uh, indication. So I won't dwell too much on that. I'm going to go more into what we do when we see the patient and when we decide to do an operation. Well, the first thing is to decide the incision. And most often we take a volar incision for volar plates. Most of the plates are on the volar side. You must open the radial aspect of the FCR sheath. Do not open on the ulnar side and dissect between the FCR and the radial artery. The important thing is not to allow any retraction there because there's only seven millimeter space between the FCR and the median nerve. So if your assistant is a strong assistant, you're going to have trouble there. If you pull that across, then the median nerve and the superficial uh, branches to the palm are going to be affected and you're going to have a very painful post-operative scar. The disadvantage of a straight incision in this position are the fact that it's difficult to reach the ulnar corner at times and you might have to then go on the ulnar side uh, uh, and try and approach this again. The other problem is that you tend to kink the median nerve far too much because of the pressure so therefore, sometimes I, I, in most of the cases now, over the last two or three years, I've been using a darted incision. The dart is over the crease and it eases the tension. The incision is still the level of the radial styloid. The flap permits reaching the ulnar corner with lesser tension. And this incision can easily be extended into the palm if you need to do a median nerve release uh, or a carpal tunnel release. And this is one such incision that you can see the ease with which you can reach the ulnar corner and with less attraction. I also like to use the GLP type self-retaining but blunt-tipped single-pronged retractor. It's a single-pronged blunt-tipped uh, self-retaining retractor. What about the scar? Since we've been doing this uh, dart in the incision, you can see the scar on the right side. It's barely seen. And in the ones that were there in the earlier, and it's surprising that when I look back and I have so many of these pictures, you can see that towards the crease, you can find thickening of the scar. And you can understand that these are not patients prone to hypertrophic scars or keloid formation. These are patients uh, be because they have a normal scar pro proximal to that, whereas the other scars are practically imperceptible. And this is uh, something that we need to look at. Going straight on to cases, here's a 61-year-old, very active uh, man, uh, and the volar spike is pretty obvious. The ulnar fracture is obvious. The comminution is obvious. The need for something to be done is extremely uh, glaring in the face. A CT scan helps to try and tell you that you're in trouble. More than that, it really does not help too much. The x-rays can give you as much information, and I agree with Rohan that uh, oftentimes, it's not really necessary for getting a CT scan. But yes, when you're planning to do a plating, whether you want to put it on the volar side or the dorsal side or the radial aspect, sometimes a CT scan is very, very helpful. Now, in this case, I proceeded to do a volar plate. But then there were fragments that were a little loose. And you can then add either a headless screw or a small screw with a washer. Or you could also use, uh, fix it down with just K-wires, as I've done here. What next? You need to do the ulna uh, as well. So you need to be careful of the ulnar, uh, the dorsal branch of the ulnar nerve. You need to identify it and get it out of the way and its branches. If you come across them, don't cut them. These are the worst nerves to get a neuroma from. So you need to get a small plate there, a two millimeter plate. So you need to plan this in advance. This does not come in the distal radius set. You have to ask for the two millimeter set only then are you going to be able to put it together like this. This gentleman uh, uh, was uh, under the care of six, seven surgeons post-operatively and uh, happened to get a CT scan, which is fantastic because if you get a good CT scan, you know where your screws are and you can see here that all the screws were in a very good position and the fragments, all of them seem to do extremely well. He had a preoperative ulnar nerve disturbance. Now, the importance of noting this on your paper on the first day is extremely important. Imagine this, an important person with an ulnar nerve problem 
which comes to light post operatively, you're in big trouble. So if you've noted it earlier, uh, it's a good thing. And then you need to follow this and see to it that the ulnar nerve, uh, usually if it's uh, uh, not too bothersome, will cure itself and does not require any further treatment. He is a patient who has a hypertrophic scar tendency, and you can see the entire scar is hypertrophic. But eventually he regained almost complete movement of his hands and a complete recovery of his ulnar nerve. Where will you put your plate? You have to stay <coughs> to, you have to put your plate proximal to the watershed line because I borrowed this slide from Randy Bindra because the moment the plate starts creeping up, it's going to start allowing the tendons to rub against it and you're going to have problems there. So you shouldn't have a very thick plate. This is an Indian plate and it's a very thick plate. It isn't beveled off. And here's a screw that's sticking out. So there are certain plates that you don't want to use. So choose your implant properly because otherwise you're already putting a patient at a disadvantage. What do you do for rim fractures? That's closer to the rim, beyond the watershed line, very difficult to treat with plates. With the conventional plates, you can't put a screw into this. So how do you then hold these fragments? So you open, reduce and temporarily fix these with K wires. The rim fragment sometimes remains unstable because it's basically an injury of the ligament, which has taken an avulsion or small flake of bone. So what you need to do is to take a stitch through the ligament, which will harness the bone and bring it back into position. Run these threads through the plate, through the small holes for the K wires in the plate, and then put the plate on in the usual fashion. Put in your screws, but not through these thin, small, flaky fragments. You're going to anchor that by tying a knot onto the plate securely. So then now you've got all the pieces in place. Add, leave the K wires in, the, the wires that you use to hold these uh, in position, the raft wires or the wires that are there that are holding this in position. You can leave them in place and eventually you'll find that he'll get a very good range of movements. You pull the wires out at about six to eight weeks. Should you cover the plate with the PQ, with the pronator quadratus? It's always nice to do that. And I always attempt to do it. And I know that a lot of people believe that it's not necessary. I believe it's necessary for two reasons. One, it was there for a purpose. And if you can put it back, it's excellent. It is considered to be one of the, it's considered to be one of the uh, dynamic stabilizers of the inferior radial ulnar joint. And if that is so, when you're talking about the distal radio ulnar joint, then when you're treating a distal radius fracture, which has that as a component, why do you want to give away one of the stable points? And secondly, it's a lovely soft tissue cover on which these, uh, the tendons are going to glide. So it's always nice to put it back. So when you're lifting it up, as you can see here, lift it up with the periosteum in one sheet and leave behind an edge so you can suture it back again or you can suture it back to the first compartment muscles uh, very gently onto the sheath. Uh, this is how it's put back. I went back in to remove plates and I find my pronator is right there. It's all healthy and nice. And that's the implants that have come out. And then I stitched it back again. So you do not sacrifice the pronator quadratus as far as possible. That's the way I look at it, except when it's torn, of course. What about these? Do you need to go in dorsally? Well, we need to think about that. Because uh, sometimes you don't need to go dorsally. You can get this fragment from the volar side. What you need to check is that the articular uh, alignment is good. The radial styloid is fixed. The overlap is minimized. And in the lateral view that the plate hides under the teardrop, that the dorsal tilt is corrected, and the styloid screw is placed perfectly within the styloid. Uh, you should have at least 75% of the length of the screw, uh, of the di uh, width of the distal radius uh, supported with the screws. And see that your proximal screws, this is where we forget. We look, we are, we are so mesmerized by the disc length that we forget the proximal screws and you can get tendon ruptures from the proximal screws. So be careful about that as well. Here's a patient who has a predominantly dorsal tempts me to go in dorsally. Now, it's a very distal fracture. So all the more reason I'm thinking if I go volarly, I'm going to be in big trouble. But there's a volar depression. How am I going to get to that from the volar dorsal side? So what you can do is take down the brachioradialis, go around and get to the dorsal fragment and have your plate on the volar side. Now, here's the same case that's been milked. 
into position and I've tried to use a rim plate. This is a different animal. It's a little more difficult. It comes in one size. It's a very difficult thing to put in. I think they have a five hole one as well. So it's two sizes, too big, so, and not the best uh, profile for Indian bones. But I've used it on occasion quite happily. So you push in your dorsal fragments and pin them down temporarily. Here you don't need to open and fix them down because you're using this only as a temporary wire. So be careful when you drill and then you can put that in, get your plate there and you can get a good result. Uh, <clears throat> what about the Wallace spike? We've seen that and we've seen what Heyman spoke about. Once you get that back in, you should check the length of your screws with what is known as the Hoya view. And the Hoya view will tell you the margin of the radius and will tell you exactly to look for screw penetration. There is a four corner concept now. Uh, I won't go into details for want of time, but all four corners are affected in this one. And this is a combination of the Rickley and Regazzoni and the Melanie classification. Uh, uh, and here's one which had all four corners involved. And here you can see that you needed to go in dorsally as well. And you need to have these plates ready. So we have a set of small plates ready in our theater at all times so that we can go in and do this and get an excellent result. Not plates for this one. This doesn't look like it needs anything until you look at the CT scan. And then you need to go in dorsally. You need to then build it up fragment by fragment. And you can see the table here. This is the fragment being built up one by one and held there with wires and then punched back into place. And eventually, the, screw, the plate has been placed in place. And this is the last case, completely shattered. Can you use a plate for this one? What are your options? There's no bone to hold. Closed reduction and bridging plate, external fixator, which may require a second procedure. Consider a radiocarpal fusion, or is there another viable option? So what I did was to go in volally, got some wires inside, got the rim fragments in, bend the wires down like you do for a fragment specific fixation, and put on my plate. And you can see as I tighten my plate, those wires get bent and stuck under the plate, and you get a fairly good articular surface all pieces back in place, wire safely under the plate, and the pronator quadrant is back in place. And this is his video sent this afternoon at one o'clock. Uh, just 20 seconds of this. Excellent dorsiflexion, restriction, a good supination, some restriction of the palm of flexion. That's hardly 20 degrees of palm of flexion in his hand, but he has no problem. It's a year out now. He, we would, uh, he was operated last May. Good radial and ulnar deviation, as you can see here. Excellent result from a very, very difficult uh, situation. So you have to use plates judiciously you need to understand where you can use them you need to understand the restrictions or the limitations of your plate you need to have additional uh, armamentarium and you should remember that external fixators and ky will come to your aid thank you very much mm -hmm.